working at SRM University Amravati since one and a half years. Um, my research interests broadly into batteries, lithium ion batteries, rechargeable batteries, and mostly into the electron testing and advanced diagnostics of lithium ion batteries over aging. And uh, with the support of our management, leadership team, and the faculty members, uh, we have been successfully able to establish SRM Amar Raja Center for Energy Storage Devices, which consists of six faculty members from various engineering disciplines and science background, physics and chemistry as well. And in SRM, I have established uh, labs for uh, again aluminum and magnesium alloys to develop new materials and also uh, working for industries. So we have started working with industries closely and uh, the industry challenges we have taken up and we have given solutions. So our products, so based on our technology, the products are presently in the market. So this uh, first slide actually are the videos from our experiments, which I'll exemplify by three stories. So this is the target for the next 50 minutes. Okay, so let me uh, say a few words uh, and it does not need any intelligence to uh, conclude that complex contemporary problems are not amenable to single discipline knowledge domain. And we have seen that discoveries are more likely on the boundaries between fields where perspective, concepts, and tools can bring new insights. The topic I've chosen today is data to discovery in information security. There are two parts to this talk. The first part is to tell you the explosion of data. And I'm going to tell you there is a concept called the revenge of silicon. And that actually makes the birth of AI almost inevitable and the data explosion that we will see. So is, is basically my talk has its roots on the storage revolution, which is the reverse of the Y2K. Revolution and high resolution sensors, both space and time. And it takes full advantage of the advances in graph theory, structured and unstructured data, machine learning, statistics, and in general data analytics. SRM University, Andhra Pradesh, Amaravati was born to offer a unique learning experience to deliver cutting-edge education, to foster innovation, and to create the leaders of tomorrow. Sprawled over 200 acres, the university has been designed by the world-renowned architecture firm Perkins and Will. The lush, green, eco-friendly campus provides a conducive environment to learning and creativity. SRM University Andhra Pradesh Amravati is a multi-stream research university with focus on diverse fields including engineering, medicine, liberal arts and management. It offers a rich selection of graduate and undergraduate programs across faculties. What's more, the faculty is highly qualified, experienced and has global exposure to mentor and support the students every step of the way. The university is currently working on developing a hydrogen fuel cell based train. We are aiming at getting the best talent available in the world. Thus, we scout for uh, highly intellectual and high profile faculty members throughout the world. And we have evolved attractive features for the faculty to join us. Generally, academicians and scientists may not look for money. What they look for is, do I have chances to build, a, to build my career if I join this institution. We are fully aware of that.
I work on childhood uh, viral diseases in in children, infants, and children. Primarily rotavirus and enteroviruses, which are related to polio virus. Okay, and we are the one of the uh, contributors to the development of Indian rotavirus vaccine. Um, uh, significantly, we contributed to the development of the vaccine in the country. And the, the, the rotavirus rotavirus vaccine is the first viral vaccine. Indigenously produced, developed, and produced in the country, um, the first viral vaccine. I have been working at SRM University, Amravati, since one and a half years. Um, my research interest broadly into batteries, lithium-ion batteries, rechargeable batteries, and mostly into the electron testing and advanced diagnostics of lithium-ion batteries over aging. And uh, with the support of our management, leadership team, and the faculty members. Uh, we have been successfully able to establish SRM Amar Raja Center for Energy Storage Devices, which consists of six faculty members from various engineering disciplines and science background, physics and chemistry as well. And in SRM, I have established uh, labs for uh, again aluminum and magnesium alloys to develop new materials, and also uh, working for industries. So we have started working with industries closely and uh, the industry challenges we have taken up and we have given solutions. So our products, so based on our technology, the products are presently in the market. So this uh, first slide actually are the videos from our experiments, which yeah. I'll exemplify. Yeah. So this is the target for the Namaste, Andy. Namaskar, Namaskar. Thank you so much. We are, highly we are highly grateful to you. Sir, sir, you, you order, we are there for a sir. Kind of like, <laughs> who am I to order? You have been our dear friend, so... Sir, thank you very much, sir. And I always say, Dr. Chandrasekhar is the promise and hope for the country. I don't which know. Dr. Chandrasekhar understands. Yeah, Narayanaji, but my request is... Uh, you should uh, move your camera a little down because your head is not seen. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, is yeah, it okay? Yeah. Okay, better, okay. Yeah. So, the uh, promise and uh, hope and promise of the country is with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Another wait, wait. Yes, sir. We can wait, sir. Don't rush. No, sir. See, for IST, always there is a standard deviation. Yes, sir. However, we say. Let slowly participants join. As I see by now, 77 uh, participants have joined. Yeah.
Dr. Chandrasekhar, you have chosen a very uh, interesting and uh, general topic so that the participants from different institutions can appreciate how science uh, has uh, changed itself, evolved, and yielded results, fruits. You will refer to Indian science or science uh, per se? I'll be no. referring to global science. Global science. Yeah. Uh, Pushpa Bhargav's book, I think, only Indian science. I did not read that book totally, mm. uh, but I have two references. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I would uh, share while my talk mm. goes on. So. Okay, okay. So globally, you will uh, good. Another, you may start after two or three minutes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, we start at three. Zero two or three zero three. Yes, sir. Yes. It is three p.m. Yeah. Where is that? You are not. You are not. Sir, shall we start? Please, please go ahead. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth uh, edition of our uh, university distinguished uh, lecture of SRM University, Andhra Pradesh. So now I invite uh, our Honorable uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor V. S. Rao, to give the welcome address. Sorry for taking time to start my video. Uh, first of all, my 
pranams to everybody dr chandrashekar and distinguished participants from the academia industry research institutions faculty from various uh, universities students and people from the media and press i welcome you all to the fourth university distinguished lecture series of srm university by the distinguished scientists we are indeed honored sir to have you deliver the lecture on saga of science from 13th century to 21st century in fact for the information of many of the participants i would like to mention that srm university has active collaboration with iict providing many opportunities to our students and faculty to interact with their scientists and also have immersive experience in the state of the art advanced research facilities available at iict as you are all aware dr chandrashekar is an innovative scientist and enterprising professional he has counseled he has rather conceived and designed molecules of interest to synthetic organic chemists and molecules of importance to many <coughs> pharmaceutical industries and molecules of relevance to the society in fact he has demonstrated through his persistent efforts many excellent outcomes of collaboration between university industry and research laboratories recently as many of us are aware within a very short time his team developed a very convenient cost effective process for the manufacturing of active pharmaceutical ingredients yes. for the drug flapiravir it is an antiviral drug as we all know so this has really made news across the globe with these words i would like to thank dr chandrashekar profusely for accepting our invitation to deliver this lecture and all the participants for their presence thank you sir thank you very much sir so now i invite uh, dr manadan department of chemistry uh, to briefly introduce our speaker thank you dr vinod good afternoon to everyone so it gives me immense pleasure to introduce uh, india's one of the greatest scientists of all time uh, of professor dr chandrasekhar sir so he is a fellow of all three indian science academies and he also ranked as top 2 person scientists across the globe recently by stanford university in the field of organic chemistry so he has joined iict 1986 as a junior research fellow and grew up to the level of chief scientist in 2010 with his outstanding contribution in 2015 he became director iict hyderabad with a vision affordable healthcare for all he had made significant contributions in diverse areas of organic chemistry and also developed the technologies for synthesis of anti tuberculosis drug beta coagulin anti tumor and abortive drug misoprostol among others he has not only inspired the fellow countryman but also the researchers across the globe on how to use polyethylene glycol as a eco friendly solvent for processing and recycling expensive metal catalyst these works 
has inspired researchers worldwide to use polyethylene glycol. He has published nearly 300 research articles and 19 patents with the overall citation of 8,000 and has guided 80 PhD students and 20 postdoctoral associates. He has received several awards, including the recent prestigious CSIR Technology Award 2020 for outstanding contribution to affordable healthcare, and also Eminent Scientist Award for contribution in the field of chemistry from Telangana State Government in 2017, and also CNR Rao National Prize for Chemical Research and Infosys Prize in Chemical Science 2014 for his contribution in synthetic organic chemistry. As our Pro, Pro Vice Chancellor mentioned, he recently led the scientific team in developing a convenient and cost-effective protocol for the synthesis of an antiviral drug, Ovipiravir, which combats against COVID-19 virus. The drug was launched by CIPLA under the brand name Ciplensa the first week of August, which cost 68 rupees per tablet, which in fact 10% cheaper than the first Ovipir brand introduced by Glenmore Pharmaceuticals the same time. So he is truly inspirational to us, and it is great honor to have him for today University Distinguished Lecture. So with these words, I request Dr. Chandrasekhar sir to deliver his lecture. Thank you, friend, for the very elaborate introduction, and uh, also greetings to Narayan Rao, dear friend, and the Vice Chancellor of SRM University. Thank you for this opportunity. It's always a pleasure to be talking to the university friends young students and colleagues and see how we can bring them back into science and motivate them to see that India prospers in science. It's a great privilege for me and I have seen the Distinguished Lecture Series was already fourth now and I've seen the three speakers have been outstanding speakers. I'm sure they have motivated all of our young colleagues who are on the call and I hope uh, the lecture I'm going to present to all of you today uh, the saga of science uh, hopefully would uh, inspire at least few young minds to take science as a profession. I also would like to tell on this platform to all my friends who are watching on uh, this platform and also hopefully later uh, when you put on the YouTube and uh, other channels. We all remember giving lectures to audience of 100, 200, 500 in a classroom. And SRM has a wonderful auditorium. You could address 500 people maybe. I think this platform, I think, has taught us that people can watch these lectures at their will and wish. And sometimes we suddenly realize that uh, several thousand people have watched this lecture. I'm sure uh, this would be uh, an important contribution by the electronic platform. I should thank uh, the friends who are running this program electronically. So what I do is, uh, without uh, wasting further time, uh, I would like to take you through the saga. Saga is nothing but the journey of uh, science uh, for about 400, 500 years. But I also would like to address the friends on the call today that please make sure that uh, all of you wear a mask. All of you keep social distance. We have seen how Delhi has taken a very big hit in the last one week. And it's a pity that even in the funeral homes, there is no place. And we don't want uh, uh, Andhra Pradesh or Telangana or any other state for that matter to undergo this problem. Certainly, as our Prime Minister has been advocating and all the doctors and also our Minister, Honorable Minister, Dr. Harshwardhanji, I think social distance is the best social vaccine till yeah. the real vaccine comes in. So I think let us practice this uh, social vaccine of uh, keeping social distance and wearing a mask. And for the friends who think I'm not wearing, I have a mask here. But just because no one is in my office, I just kept it aside. Um, but I request all of you that every time, please wear a mask and carry some sanitizer with you so that uh, we can uh, make sure that this disease is not spread. We are lucky that uh, so many vaccines are in race now. And by February, March, maybe we will have enough vaccines and we'll get some kind of a protection. So with these uh, few alerts on COVID, I would like to start uh, uh, sharing my screen now. And hopefully it should work. So 
maybe my friend uh, who's uh, Vinod or maybe Manathan should tell me. Yes, sir. Uh, whether you're able yeah. to see the slides now. Yes, yeah, sir. we can yes, see, yes. sir. We can see. Okay, super. Okay. Yes. And also yes. can hear me. So good. So friends, actually, what I will try to do is now the title is basically the 13th uh, to 21st century, the saga of science. And I represent uh, Indian Institute of Chemical Technology. Just to give you what is IICT, we are actually a group of uh, laboratories, about 38 labs across the country uh, under the Ministry of Science and Technology and uh, under the AGs of uh, Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. So we are part of the government of India and uh, our charter is to make sure that uh, science reaches masses. So whole my presentation today uh, would be taking a lot of content uh, from these two books. Uh, those colleagues who have inclination to read uh, books like novels, uh, I think I strongly advocate uh, they should buy these two books. Maybe SRM could keep uh, digital yeah. copies in their library and yeah. uh, people could read. Uh, one is by John Gribbin, Science, a History. And of course, uh, all of us are following very closely uh, Yuval Noah Harari. Many books uh, he has written in a series of uh, called Sapien series. So in that series, he has written a recent book called uh, 20 le 21 Lessons uh, for the 21st Century. So we are also trying to write a small book, which hopefully should appear in the next few months. Uh, 20 Lessons Learned from COVID, actually. So hopefully that should book also should be available in a few months from now. And all of us suddenly realize that scientists are the most important creatures on the planet. Traditionally, scientists are looked as uh, uh, human beings with uh, who don't know how to shave. They don't wear proper dress. They always are uh, roaming around with sort of fumes around Bunsen burner, sulfuric acid, copper sulfate. This is how scientists are uh, uh, depicted in the movies. Whereas they show villains with the nicely well-dressed people uh, with a lot of nice houses and swimming pools behind them and all that. But some of the movie and uh, drama industry has looked at scientists uh, showing that he has no money even to shave actually. Mm. But the scientists look pretty okay, I think. I'm sure people are watching me on, on the YouTube and uh, on this channel. And many of you are also scientists. Professor Rob is well-dressed. I'm sure. So <laughs> I think we need to tell that scientists don't look like that. So science, I think just to tell all of you is a personal activity because science has to be driven by individual. You cannot ask someone, you do science, you do science. I think as Professor Rao was mentioning, science has to come from within you and don't look at money or don't look at the fame and name you get and all that. I think it is a personal activity and with very few exceptions, scientists throughout the history have applied their craft, not through lust for glory, we never do science for glory. I think automatically glory will come. We never plan that I'll make a movie. This movie will be super duper hit and uh, my producer will make uh, $2 billion. I don't think we make science just for that. I think we keep doing science and automatically glory will come back. And uh, generally, uh, we satisfy the curiosity. I think that's what uh, drives uh, all of us. So these are the messages you get from uh, these two books, hopefully. So what is a scientist? I think let us uh, lay a definition at scientist because I know many of our colleagues who are watching uh, this may be engineering college students because SRM is known for engineering, but there are also a lot of uh, science programs with you. I visited your departments, excellent infrastructure you have built both in Chennai and uh, uh, Vijayawada Amravati campus. I had the privilege of visiting both places. And uh, if you look at the definition of scientist, even engineers nowadays, uh, call them, they don't call engineers or uh, technologists. They call them engineering sciences. Mm -hmm. So they would like to be proudly calling themselves engineering sciences. Previously, we used to call B.Tech, B.E. and all that. But I think now people want to attach themselves with science because science gives a lot of happiness and a uh, um, lot of visibility. So what's the definition of science? The intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world. I think if you look at science definition, science is not that you do something, you observe the, what is happening around you. That is how science evolves. You find a problem. Suddenly you find someone who is not able to make food sufficient. Okay, now there's a problem for a scientist. Okay, how I should make sufficient food? Or suddenly he sees someone without proper clothing. Oh, how can I make affordable clothing? So I think that is how science is basically observation. If you look at astronomy, it's by observation. Physics, it's by observation. So I think basically, if you're a scientist, you need to have some rules in your life. Scientists cannot be very, very uh, 
running around uh, drifting away from uh, main themes a scientist should see failure as a beginning we should never get demotivated if there is a failure actually science life begins with failures so we should take it for granted that failures are the starting point in a scientist life and never stop learning even if you fail many a times we fail and then we give up the activity i think scientists should never stop learning and always make sure that whatever little we know we should keep teaching others because that is where our teachings become beginning for the next fellow if i do a small project and i get some results rather than keeping the results with me i share i talk to others and teach that so that he knows what is the benchmark currently now he will try to improve over that that's how i think science progresses and science has to be always analyzed objectively and we also should practice humility i think scientists are the most humble people on the planet if you see professor c n r rao i think who has been a great uh, advocate of science or if you look at uh, abdul kalam i think these look at them and how hum uh, humble these people are similarly scientists always accept criticism we don't uh, fight with people who criticize if someone says uh, chandra your science is not good i will not get offended okay i think tell me what is the right i should do then i will change myself and do better science i think we always like to get criticism and we always like to give credit to others also whoever gives contributions i think we give credit to them and we always should take initiatives not that someone does and i will follow i think we should be the beginners in life and always ask tough questions many a times what happens is researchers for getting publications very quickly or getting some recognition very quickly we ask easy questions and uh, get easy answers i think they will not take us anywhere i think we should ask very tough questions and i think get the right answers and that's where i think we all will prosper and world will prosper i think love what you do if you don't like science i think don't be in science this is a subject where you have to love science otherwise you leave science i think that's what uh, we would like to say now if you look at science unfortunately like any other community religion caste country we also have bifurcated and uh, multiplied ourselves into multiple branches so science is one activity we should not say science is biology science is earth science or science is physics science is chemistry i think science is science i think we should not differentiate that one science is bigger or one science is smaller i think that's what we should learn at the beginning then i think we will start respecting each other so it's something i think we all should learn that's why i also would like to say that engineering is also a science medical also is a science so it's not that if you study bsc you are a scientist if you study mbbs you are a great fellow i think both are equal i think without science i think mbbs uh, doctor cannot prescribe any medicine today if you want a chemist or a biologist unless they discover a drug how mbbs doctor will write a prescription i think a doctor knows only what is available in apollo pharmacy but a scientist knows how this drug was made and got into apollo pharmacy so i think that's what i think we should tell that science is the most important activity on the planet if you look at scientists we are not just poster boys we we'll all think that if i do science i'll put a banner i know when i go to srm university rav is very generous he will put a big banner at the entrance and keep my photograph so i think scientists don't want you or photo on the banner we are not politicians that we should have 100 feet banner and 20 feet banner look at these people i mean they are the most humble people on the planet and they are eternal as long as science is there these people will be remembered any one who opens a textbook they know who is isaac newton who is albert einstein who is maxson who is crick who is abdul kalam who is professor cnr i think they don't require banners they don't require posters even if you keep a poster from amitabh bachchan after 10 years we'll forget if someone does a uh, kaun barega karbati program better than him we'll all forget him similarly we forgot chiranjeevi i mean he was our superstar we forgot him i don't think uh, today our vinod kumar who is amravati will go and see pavan kalyan because pavan kalyan was a star some day today he is around vijayawada going around the roads i don't think he will go and see them <laughs> Animals cannot have research labs. Animals cannot go to university. I think they cannot flourish like us. Science must start with facts and end with facts. 
no matter what theoretical structures it builds in between. So if you look at imagination and creativity, not induction that generates real scientific theories. If you look at Karl Popper between 1900, then Robert Grosse. So these are all the fathers of science, Aristotle in the 300 year. So these are all the people who are considered to be the first scientists who have taught us what is science. So if you look at the science as a beginning, some people may say that uh, chemistry is the big subject. Because I play play or maybe someone says uh, physics is much bigger because someone else practiced physics. Someone says biology is better. I think all science are equal. But if you look at all the sciences, astronomy and physics were the early sciences because astronomy did not require any tool. What astronomers required was late evening on a day when moon was not there, you go out and start looking at the stars with a naked eye. And that's how whole astronomy began. So for astronomists, what he needs is darkness, basically. So he can go and make astronomy by looking at the sky. That's how actually whole astronomy was built. The first scientific observations were the sky, stars, planet, comet, supernova. And Copernicus in 1400 uh, described revolution of celestial bodies. And he has established the revolution of planets, how planets revolve around. Then Bruno, stars are the distant sun. We all believe that stars are too small, but stars are much larger than the sun. Because sun is closer to you, you see the light of sun. But stars are much more brighter than the sun, actually. And there is no center to universe. I think that's what uh, Bruno taught us. Similarly, if you look at Taco Brahe, 1500 to 1600, called Naked Eye Astronomer, actually, he was able to see the entire planet with the naked eye. Similarly, he refuted the belief of unchanged universe. Then the precise measurement identified supernova 1572. So these are all the great innovations which have happened in the astronomical sciences. So if you look at the path breakers, as soon as someone has found a small binocular or a small telescope, what you need, two glasses, two mirrors, and you can build a binocular, or you can build a telescope and you can start seeing things closer to what they are. That's how Kepler, Galileo, these are all the fathers of astronomical sciences. And sometimes even they challenged what was taught in your churches and temples. And they were given punishment actually, or how can you say that what my religion told is wrong and what you're telling is correct. But end of the day, if you look at Galileo, heliocentric universe was controversial. He was championing of heliocentric universe. But then he had to face inquest. I think he was arrested. His mother was punished. I think many things happened those days, but still he stood by, I think, what he told. Similarly, if you look at biological sciences, as I told astronomical sciences and physics, if you call them the eldest brothers of all science subjects, biological sciences are the second uh, oldest or the second child of the science. It's born in 1635. Again, what scientists required was a small microscope. When people discovered telescope, they also started the microscopes. So if you look at uh, scientist Robert Hooke, he was born in 1635. If you can call him the first biologist of this planet, modern science. I mean, I'm not talking of uh, Mahabharata, Ramayana, I mean, maybe our Egyptian culture and all that. We are talking of the science which is recorded in the textbooks beyond 1400, where journals began, where people started documenting some kind of evidences. So if you look at uh, this uh, Robert Hooke, he was not expected to be surviving because he had a lot of uh, problems when he was born with genetic disorders and he could not take solid food. But despite all that, he went on to become father of the entire biology. So most important discoveries, if you look at it, cellular structures of slices of cork, microorganisms, sperm cells, structure of feathers, nature of butterfly wings, compound IFF fly. So many, many things he discovered and he wrote micrographia, concerned with microscopy. So whatever he could see under the microscope, he was able to make into a small book and that's how the signs of bacteria and all that has uh, begun. So if you look at uh, the uh, surgeries and dissections, I think that was the next science which evolved. If you look at Andrea Vazella, Gabriel Fallopio, or if you look at Shishruta, which is uh, part of our great Hindu and Ayurvedic mythology. If you look at all of our traditions and all this, if you look at how these uh, discoveries happened. So Andrea Vesela is called founder of human anatomy. He published several books on that. And of course, Gabriel Fallopio, without any tools, he was able to look at the inner parts of the ear. How can you see inner part of the ear and do small surgeries? 
Similarly, Shashruta made a lot of tools actually for surgery, small, small microorganisms, micro scissors and all that those days uh, to make these. Actually, these people, unfortunately, were branded as the thieves of dead bodies. So these people used to go in the late night into some graveyard and try to take out the dead bodies which are half burnt or which are buried, take them, take them to the house, dissect them, see what is happening inside and all that. I think that is how the whole surgery has begun. So these are the very brave people. I can tell you most of our youngsters and people who are there, if you ask them to go to a graveyard in the late evening, forget about late evening, even 6 p.m., they get panic. But then these are the people who really went, discovered new things, and that's how today surgeries have become important uh, uh, in investment, I mean, innovations in the human health care. Today, cancer cannot be cured without a surgery. Even heart diseases cannot be cured without surgery. So chemistry is the most youngest subject, which I represent. So if you look at chemistry, what chemistry is basically, you take two or three materials, put them together, heat, boil, and see what changes they have. That's how I think the chemistry evolves. Chemistry is nothing but taking some chemicals, putting them together and heating. So if you want to heat, you also like to know how you want to heat. How do you measure the temperature? You can't just burn them into charcoal. So since James Watt discovered the steam engine and we know how to measure temperature in Fahrenheit or degree centigrade, that is where the chemistry real subject has begun. So we could consider the person who discovered thermometer to measure the temperature. I think that should be the first in innovation which helped chemistry to take up. Similarly, if you look at some of these innovations in the periodic table, we all celebrated last year uh, the periodic table, uh, Mendeleevian periodic table, 150 years of periodic table. Elements are disappearing. How can we protect them I in elements? We all abuse lithium element. You know, all our bodies have lithium now. Your handphone, laptop, you name everywhere. We take lithium, lithium, lithium. If lithium is over. What will happen? The whole world will become dark. The lithium is not there on the planet. So elements are also getting now depleted. So how can we now get more and more uses for the elements which are more surplus? That is where I think inorganic chemistry, metallurgy, all these things will play an important role in the next 30, 40 years. So if you look at elements, how they are discovered, for example, someone who does not even know that a gas called oxygen exists. So he thought, uh, if you look at uh, Henry uh, Cavendish, who discovered the presence of hydrogen, water is not an element, but a compound. <laughs> Everyone thought water is one element, actually. But then he said it's not an element, it has H2O. Similarly, Lavoisier, diamond is combustible. Sulfur gains weight on burning. These are all the innovations which were early scientific innovations. If you look at discovery of oxygen, the scientists thought whole planet has oxygen, actually. But then he also believed that everything is not oxygen. So what he did, he took uh, some mice, kept under a belly jar, and started looking at it. How long this uh, mice will survive? He found that they lived for a day or two, and then they all died because whatever oxygen was there, it consumed. It produced carbon dioxide, and those animals died. But then he produced pure oxygen by burning mercury oxide. And that is where the next experiment he has done. Now, again, same animals he has kept under this bell jar. Now, instead of staying for a day, they, those animals survived for three days. Now, he said, whatever air is there in our atmosphere, it is not everything oxygen. It's only one third is oxygen. That is why if I put pure oxygen, mercury oxide, animal live for three days. If I put naked air, it lives only one day. So, he said one third is the oxygen. So how simple experiment he has done without knowing the name, molecular weight, atomic weight, he was able to discover that oxygen constitutes one third of our environment. So if you look at uh, X-ray discovery, again, we all adore at uh, Marie Curie, the risk she has taken in life, how she got to Nobel Prizes. I think these are all the most inspirational sciences which all happened in the 18th century, early part of 1900. So when we talk of 13th century, 14th century, we saw how science evolved with microscope, Galileo, telescope, how people made gases. So, but if you come to 1900, already a little bit of equipment, little bit of science, little bit of funding started happening. So we see more and more science happening. So this is how in the 1900, the science began. But then why do we science? Why do we do science? Why, first of all, I should do science? When animals don't do science and they are very happy, why should I do science? So if you do science and share with planet, one, we get a lot of health, good health. We all know the importance of health today because of pandemic, we all got panic, we are all shut down, closed our windows, doors, not knowing that virus is so small, even if you close your door, it will come inside. So health is the most important thing to all of us. That's why we all start trying new things 
to get the best health of course we need lot of food so we need good agriculture we need good energy so if all three are there properly i think people become very very happy and healthy but if you look at the happiest countries these are the list and india unfortunately does not rank well so we also should teach our friends who are on the call today and all of us how to be happy is also very important i think okay we publish a good paper in impact factor 20 i get some award i get a badnagar award or infosys award or whatever but i think end of the day we also should learn how to be happy i think that's something we need to teach and i think that should be how to behave happiness is also should be part of the curriculum so if you look at the entire uh, the scan of paleolithic to neolithic to bronze era 18th century 1900 1950 we are coming to 2020 the kind of pandemic i have shown you on the slide here we were living for 30 years once upon a time but then as science progressed we started learning how to fight with animal insects bacteria all that slowly i think we started living for longer unfortunately pandemic made us again panic today if pandemic continues i'm sure we will more and more people start dying and again average age will come down but thanks to vaccine research thanks to drugs what we discovered i think we are able to control this pandemic quite okay currently hopefully if you are more stringent strict for next 6 months 8 months hopefully i think this will be out of uh, business so i just showed you uh, what uh, professor ram mentioned about siplens you can see on the slide what we made and you can see very proudly at least iict is very proud that iict logo is there on this tablet if you go to shop and buy siplens uh, for a covid patient you will see iict logo on that how scientists have contributed uh, to this important uh, treatment so for good health what you need you need to prevent unfortunately what is that you need to prevent wear a mask you can prevent the disease or you have a vaccine then you can prevent our country stood up we are able to make now cure we have drugs for that so this is how a good health uh, will come in so what i would try to tell you is how these drugs were innovated in the early part of 1920 that means around 20th century how drugs came into all of us sulfamethoxazole if you read this story uh, paul elrich proposed certain dyes could selectively stain bacterial cells and kill them but then who will trust you so what he did he took a prontosil the first azadai and he treated streptococca infection and then grahad domak administered this drug to his daughter who was suffering as a clinical trial not knowing how it works and all that so the kind of uh, inventions made those days no clinical trial no phase 1 i'm sure all of you today watch television uh, bcgi will come aims or nih will come and say phase 1 there's a problem phase 2 all now even common man knows what's the phase 1 trial what the phase 2 trial all that uh, thanks to covid but those days nothing he quickly called his daughter you're suffering take this dye let us see what will happen and that's how the entire antibiotics were discovered similarly vaccines if you look at the entire history of vaccines the prediction currently is now that everyone knows what is a vaccine thanks to bharat biotech i think we are likely to get a vaccine from india now many indian companies are making vaccines how vaccines are made once upon a time you take horse or something inject the virus make sure that it gets reacted those antibodies are extracted antigens are extracted i mean you make bottles and then get into chicken pox small pox vaccine all that today we are talking of mrna vaccine dna vaccine attenuated vaccine so how the vaccine evolution happened from 1700 that means if you talk of 18th century to 21st century how the entire vaccine gamut has enhanced today we are talking of vaccines for hepatitis and we never thought that a vaccine could be discovered in less than 8 months march or february we had pandemic and already november 30000 uh, volunteers are given vaccine in hyderabad today pfizer has given 30000 people russia has given 30000 people so within 8 months how scientists could make a vaccine and give hope to the entire planet similarly there are some drugs which come from marine sources come algae from fungi So if you look at this uh, rapamycin, which we call it Amrut, actually this molecule even can enhance the life of people. So scientists have to go to every horizon. You can go under the sea, 
get those sponges corals andhra you are located you have such a large coast you can take all those sponges corals see what chemicals are present how we can use them for human health care i think that is how our drugs will start coming and best health care will happen but then while we start discovering drugs and make the world happy by making them healthy unfortunately diseases keep adding up like we never thought a pandemic will come like this who knows another pandemic will come so are we prepared for next pandemic we thought 1918 pandemic came again 2020 2019 pandemic came so everyone says 100 years after a pandemic came who knows it may come in 30 years 50 years or it may never come but then can we to use artificial intelligent tools how viruses undergo mutation how bacteria undergoes mutation so what kind of changes are likely to happen i think we need to now engage artificial intelligence how predictive science will happen and see what new diseases will come we never thought hiv aids will come around 1980 and 90 hiv was a big pandemic actually we were all scared i think some of the young colleagues on the call will not know but my professors and the vice chancellor they all know in 1780s we were scared to go to barber shop because if you go to barber shop he does shaving the razor may carry hiv virus and we get hiv so if you kiss someone virus will come so there was a lot of concepts around hiv and uh, then we got hiv drugs again iict played an important role in launching a drug called azt azithromycin that was one of the blockbuster drugs which similarly many new diseases lifestyle disease obesity cardiovascular high blood pressure cancer type 2 diabetes and people drink alcohol like get liver problems then respiratory infections like what we have in corona hiv diarrhea tuberculosis malaria so we never know what kind of diseases will kill all of us so best is that we should start discovering newer and newer drugs today if you look at this slide malaria drugs we have mefloquine artether amodaquine primaquine we all know that how hydroxychloroquine which is used for uh, malaria has become an important drug because trump suddenly told that hydroxychloroquine can cure corona and suddenly lot of clinical trials whole world was begging india whether you can give chloroquine to our country so india is certainly hub of all the world healthcare again similarly a lady who discovered artemisinin for malarial treatment got a nobel prize again what inspiration her daughter was sent to boarding school and she went to lab to do research and when she came back after accomplishing her duties her daughter forgot the mother so that is the commitment she has then how many of us can get inspiration from person like her similarly sponges as i told you if you go to your marine sponges uh, in visakhapatnam wherever you are see you go get those sponges kalinol is a sponge and that can give you drug which can cure malaria if malaria cannot be cured by artether or cannot be cured by hydroxychloroquine this molecule which currently we are working in hyderabad iict kalinol which is a terpenoid this can work on multi drug resistant to uh, malarial uh, parasites similarly if you look at uh, alzheimers as i told you this is another major health disorder we are likely to face as we live 80 years 90 years suddenly brain disorders will come cns disorders will come we start forgetting things we all know that uh, uh, at the age of 80 85 suddenly the brain cells will start deep playing and alzheimer disease will trigger so galanthamine is an alkaloid which come from a plant source so this is again a drug we need alzheimer drugs also very very badly suddenly at the age of 70 75 you are driving your car and suddenly you forget which is accelerator which is brake then imagine fate of people walking on the roads so we need to also have drugs for alzheimer disease otherwise it will kill more people similarly galanthamine that's what i said come from a plant source so we need to see how we can make these drugs tuberculosis as i told you 30% of the world population have latent tuberculosis infection indians are more prone so we need drugs otherwise if this bug, this bacteria if it becomes very smart guy like coronavirus then where is the drug for us so again we need to make drugs ready whenever tuberculosis becomes a challenge can we have a vaccine we know when we were child we took bcg vaccine but that was not added in current uh, regime anywhere but i'm sure when i was young i was given a bcg vaccine but that gives protection only when you are a child but as you grow older this vaccine will not work so can we make new drugs for tuberculosis it if you know amitabh bachchan got tuberculosis so no exceptions nelson mandela got tuberculosis so don't think that only someone will get celebrities will not get everyone can anyone can get tuberculosis so we need to have drugs for that remember isoniazid rifampicin pyrazinamide ethambutol these are the only drugs currently available 
we made a review last year what are the drugs available currently for tuberculosis but then we thought this review will excite some colleagues some young people they start discovering new tuberculosis drugs only recently one more drug was discovered in uh, 2012 which is called bedaquilin so if no drug works now doctor gives bedaquilin and this can cure to certain extent tuberculosis but who knows mycobacterium get resistance for this also then what next so we have next generation drugs also so but unfortunately when i go to my students or my fellow scientists and ask where do you get chemicals they say i can buy from aldrich catalog or i can buy from rankem catalog or i can buy from avra catalog i think people should know and then if you go and ask a doctor unfortunately where do you get a drug are you go to apollo pharmacy or you go to some other pharmacy drugs are available but i think we should tell them that the amount of effort amount of we have to mine the entire planet to take out the chemicals as i told entire periodic table is currently depleting to make the drugs to make the batteries to make your fuel to make your energy everything i think we are depleting energy entire environmental elements are getting depleted so we need to teach also that how we should use these chemicals very very carefully we all suddenly started looking at the newspapers that india depends 80% 90% on our neighboring country for all the drugs alarming situation if you look at those who are studying uh, chemistry at intermediate level also will understand the chemistry structures i put very simple structure benzene and we all know that paracetamol is nothing but 4 acetylamino phenol and this drug we think you can go to medical shop and you pay 50 paisa and you get a paracetamol tablet and we all got used to a new name called dolo because all the corona whenever people get corona fever doctor gives you dolo but dolo is 650 mg paracetamol normal 500 mg is paracetamol but 650 mg dose is called dolo and all corona patients are currently are given dolo for 10 days how it is made it starts from benzene actually benzene is what it comes from petroleum industry you take petroleum a refinery you get naphtha crack benzene oxidized to phenol you make nitrophenol you get amino phenol you make asm phenol so how petroleum industry petroleum engineers refining chemists biologists all should join hands then only we can beat our neighboring country to make india atmanirbhar so what we dug in the last covid pandemic as uh, in the opening remarks our friends told there were three drugs which became blockbuster remdesivir fevipiravir initially hydroxychloroquine so iict and my students and my colleagues what we started we started making these drugs so remdesivir is the nucleoside of gilead we never know gilead will give a license to india or not because it was under patent so quickly we made a process if they don't give a license to india whether we can take a compulsory route and help indian patients but gilead has been very generous so they gave a voluntary license many companies got license now they make remdesivir similarly fevipiravir was off patent drug it was a old drug of japan no patent we made this drug then we made hydroxychloroquine and as i told you towards atmanirbharta those who know chemistry top half of the slide you see how difficult it is to make fevipiravir you need to do eight operations if you see compound number 1 to fevipiravir later you take one you do methanol sulfuric acid bromosuccinamide again all those chemicals and finally you get fevipiravir but what iict did very differently diethyl melanate which is basically a easy chemical available it's almost like 200 rupees per kilo we took that chemical and made fevipiravir in less than 8 weeks actually it took only 20 days for us to make the compound and today it is sold in the market 40 rupees while my friend told 68 rupees but it's brought down to 40 rupees so this is how we made it more affordable similarly we worked on remdesivir we made a drug of choice so i will not bore you with chemistry but future of healthcare by 2030 who knows we now that we know how to make vaccines so quickly we may get vaccine for many diseases and no pandemic will come so pray and wish that uh, we don't get any pandemics in the near future and our next generation will not suffer like we have suffered for one year so next happiness comes when you have lot of agriculture how agriculture comes you need food evolution how man became uh, agrarian when we st- we could not kill animals actually when human being came onto this planet the job was take a stone kill an animal and eat the raw animal i think that's how the human life began for all of us but just on a lighter note how vegetarians have become those people who are scared to kill an animal who could not chase an animal they thought okay let me station here only like a lazy fellow i'm a vegetarian by the way okay so let me eat whatever is there above me so i look up and see i see one tree 
or some leaf I pluck and eat. So then slowly the tree got dry. I don't know what to eat. Then I started learning how to make agriculture. We started living together in a small group. That's how colonies formed. Then colonies went on to become small, small towns and towns became countries. And that's how I think we all got into United countries and all that. So this how whole food evolution taught us to live independently and also dependently. So the evolution we started with, uh, as I told, plucking. Today we have tractors. Now we have gone beyond tractors to drones now. We can do agriculture even using the drones now. And from one acre, we used to get three bags of rice. Maybe we went to 30, 30 bags. Can we go to 300 bags? Because now land is depleting. So revolutions will come, like green revolution, blue revolution, white revolution, whatever you want to call. Those revolutions came and helped us to get that sufficient food, milk, fish. Everything was available thanks to all these revolutions in the agriculture. But then what is the next evolution we have to get? Suddenly we see that even the land is less, insects are increasing, we got, get next generation pesticides. But we know that if you use a lot of pesticides, we have seen in Amritsar, Batinda, Punjab, people get cancer because they abuse pesticides. There's a train which takes, uh, I think from Batinda to uh, Delhi or somewhere, uh, to carry cancer patients actually. So we need to make sure that even chemicals are eco-friendly. Again, it goes back to chemistry. While you want to be independent agriculture, we want eco-friendly agricultural norms. Then if you want to eat non-vegetarian, then chicken is becoming expensive. Chicks are expensive now. So you do breeding now. So you start uh, 1957, you look, chick was very small. Now you breed, breed, breed. I think it becomes larger and larger. You get more meat out of the same size chicken. Similarly, in the corn, you see smaller corn, you become larger corns. So genetic interventions helped us to increase size of the crop, what we get also. Similarly, my lab uh, next to CCM and IICT, we have another lab called CCMB, is our neighboring lab. For vegetarian people, don't require to kill an animal. You can make meat in the lab also. So this is another innovation people are trying to make now. So how can you make meat in the lab now? So these are the next generation innovations which can help for food and agriculture. But then are you happy if you have just agriculture and health? You are not happy, you want energy also. Because without light, without mobile phone, without battery, without fuel, how life will run. So first energy, what we had, the light source was sun. But because there was a wildfire, because of sun in forest, that fire was stored in some caves. And slowly that fire was preserved. Actually, people used to keep the fire forever in a cave, slowly burn, burn, burn. But then we know how to make a matchstick. Then we learn how to make bulbs. Then we got into mercury lamps. Then LEDs, I don't know what kind of next generation bulbs, lights, we all get. So that's how evolution of light began to all of us. So we have to imagine whether the next light would be what more than LED, what would be the next generation light, which can consume less energy, but give you more brightness. So if you look at invention of fire and all that, some 400,000 BC onwards, we know how to make uh, the light. Okay. But then energy cannot be dependent on coal. It cannot be depending on digging your wells for oil. You cannot keep on depending on Middle East. Who knows suddenly he will say, I don't have enough. I'm consuming myself. We cannot go and do a war. So how do you make fuel then? So ultimate fuel, hopefully the smartest fuel, I think as Professor Sina Rao teaches all of us, water is going to be the best fuel to all of us because sea is unlimited for us. 70% of the planet is sea. So how can you do breaking of water to get hydrogen becomes the cleanest energy without any byproducts. So how do we get into that area? Now, wind, biomass, hydro, solar, geothermal, tidal, everything has some advantage, some disadvantage. The moment you get into wind energy, people will come and say, no, no, when your wind uh, tunnel is moving around like a big fan, some birds are getting hit there, birds are dying, environmentalists will come complain. It makes a little bit of noise, neighbors will complain. So everything has a disadvantage. If you start using biomass, then what about cattle? Poor cattle will not get food. If you start taking grass and converting into ethanol, bioethanol and all that, they will lose their food. So end of the day, how can we make our own fuel without disturbing the entire ecosystem? But while all that we are doing currently, I think we should make sure that environment is the ultimate. If environment or the nature gets angry, we cannot survive. So how do we leave the minimal carbon footprint? How do you control the greenhouse gases? Circular economy, circular science. If I am taking from Mother Nature lithium in the form of carbonate, if I make lithium and make my battery, 
after my battery is consumed, I should give back to Mother Nature a lithium carbonate only. <coughs> I cannot give it back as radioactive element and then Mother Nature will be upset. Similarly, if I take carbon from nature, I should give back carbon. I cannot give carbon monoxide. I think these are the science, next generation science. That's what I said, 2050. Science has to be totally circular. So far, what we are doing is one way. Okay, let me make my product. I'm happy. But I think as by 2050, as I told, 21st century saga, while we began with 13th century with Galileo, but 21st century, 2050, I think we need to make sure that we build entire circular economy and circular science. Whatever I take from nature, I give back mother nature in the same form. I think that should be our motto. So what basic human needs provide everyone free of charge will be taken for granted. I think we also should make sure that we don't take anything free from nature. Similarly, a lot of automation happens, artificial intelligence. Tesla may produce very intelligent cars. Now, I think we all know that Tesla makes a car where driver is not required. Then what happens to all the Uber drivers? Uber fellows will lose their jobs already because of Corona, they lost their jobs, unfortunately. If this smartness comes to cars, then we have to create employment for now human beings. So there are more challenges as science and electronics and engineering progresses, but certainly there are more opportunities and next generation young boys and girls who are on this call today, I invite them that I think they should take that there's a great excitement in science and they should come into science and engineering. I don't differentiate and make sure that science, engineering, medicine, medical doctors, all of them should join hands together to make this planet a livable planet. Not that we should make a planet like what uh, we see on this slide. That now already we are struggling to wear a mask every day. And by 2050, if radiation increases and everyone is asked to wear a radio protective gears and uh, wear metal uh, containing suits and all that and wear oxygen cylinder. And I think everything we will not like to live on this planet. I think instead of making Chitti 2.0, I think we should make nature more friendly and we should go back to life without mask, without sanitization. But that will happen when we respect the nature. I hope uh, I'm able to convey that uh, this... You know what happened? You know, you unmute yourself first. Uh, probably, what happened? Sir, probably some uh, internet uh, connection from his end. I he think said, once sir. it resolved, it will join. So, no issue. What's happening half a second, half a minute? Chris. Yeah, now he's back. Did he lose the connection? Yeah, yeah. The final slide, uh, it uh, went off, sir. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Can you see the slide now? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can see, yeah. sir. Yeah. Okay. I'm just telling that uh, history of science is essential to understand the process, trends, and future of science for human well-being. So those people who want, who desire human well-being, I think they all should come into science and make sure that we are all the happy souls. Thank you. Jai Hind. All the best. So thank you very much, sir. So now I... Uh... Uh, request uh, Dr. Sabeh Sakshi of Department of Chemistry to take up the question and answer. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vinod. Um, and thank you, sir, also for your wonderful and engaging talk, uh, which is also evident that many interesting questions are asked. We would like to take some of those. For example, mm, the first question we'd like to take from Mr. Yeswant P. So, Murli, can you unmute? Uh, him and he can ask the question. Hello. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I muted him. Let's. Okay. Yes, sir, please go ahead. Mr. Yashwan. Okay. Then maybe I can. Yes. Yes. So he's asking. Like, can we see all biological activity? via atoms and its arrangements so that some of the rearrangements within, I mean, we can do with the drug discovery and something. So. Can you repeat the question? Uh, can we see all biological activity via atoms and its arrangements? Uh, you cannot see by atomic arrangement, but you can map the compound when you take a molecule and give it to a living cell or a human, I mean, animal model or anything. 
using resonance imaging and uh, tagging and all that, you can see how your molecule is going and all that. Absolutely, that's possible. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. So we go to the next uh, person, uh, Mr. Uh, Pravat Kumar Swain. He has a very interesting question. Uh, Muli, can you please uh, unmute? Yeah, I unmuted. Pravant, you can, you can ask a question. Yeah, Mr. Pravat, you can ask a question. No, I think he's still unmuted. Still muted, you mean? I mean, sorry, yeah, still muted, yes. I can Morali, see. Uh, please try to unmute. Yeah, because yeah, we I, want I the participant again. directly ask the question. Yes. yes Hello? Now, now he can possible, To the possible extent. Yeah. Hello? Hello, yeah, sir? Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, sir, 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 Namaskar, sir. Uh, Hello? Namaskar, boliye. Uh, sir, actually, I am very happy to see you and listen to your lecture. After some months, sir, maybe last year I met you in IIT in Bombay. Okay. So actually, I, I have a question. Do you believe people or scientists will happen in India in near, near future like the 10 happiest country around the world? Please give your suggestions about this. Mm. Are happiness, I'm not a saint or a Sadhguru to tell you how to be happy, okay? <laughs> I think happiness has to come from in, internally, okay? You, whatever you have, be content, but then take life as a challenge. Contentness sometimes makes you lazy, okay? So, contentness should to be to yourself, but then look at the world. What is that I should make? Make people around you happy, okay? Then automatically you will be happy and more people will become happy. Okay. Science will give you a lot of solutions, I'm told. As I told, good health. Okay. If you can afford proper food, then your family is not suffering. Why you're unhappy, suddenly one of our family members die or in a hospital. But then if we can address the health, if we can get best meal to all our family members, I think that's where happiness starts building. Don't worry. Okay, sir. Okay. So, okay, so we'll go to the next question. So from uh, Raja Panir Selvam, uh, he's from uh, Germany. So, Mulli, can you kindly unmute? Yeah, uh, I unmuted him. Yes, now he can able to. Uh, Raja, can you can you talk? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Thank you for the wonderful talk, sir. I'm Raja Pandian from Germany. I would like to know, like in your vision, what will be the areas, like futuristic areas of research in India or all over the world? Today, you look at what is happening. We are big challenges in health sector. We have very big challenges in energy sector. As for food is concerned, while we have still some limitations in African countries, but I think agriculture, we have world is producing surplus agriculture. But energy and health, I think these are going to be important challenges in health also, as uh, we create more problems of taking mining and all that or radioactivity. So we are seeing more and more people suffering from cancer because of lifestyle disorders. We are getting people into diabetes and world is becoming almost diabetic hub. Actually, any country you see obesity. So I think health, if you can address properly and most probably predict you actually how one would get diseases in future. For example, if I know at the age of 20 that by 50, I'll get say, for example, X disease. So what precautions I should take based on my food habits or based on my genetic sequence? I think that predictive models uh, would play an important role. And I think AI will take over. Thank you, sir. Okay. So we'll go probably the last question. So I would like to request uh, Murli to unmute Prashant Ratna Parakhi so that he can speak. Greeting, sir. Am I audible? Yes, yes. 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 Sir, thank you for a nice talk. I just wanted to ask uh, why in India, since we claim that Ayurved has provided very, very brilliant solutions, somehow Indians themselves don't tend to believe it. And why there is no aggressive attempt made in India to validate these claims and actually generate an entire world of opportunities, which we are just probably keeping it undercover. <laughs> We would, I would like to hear your views on this, sir. 
Prashant, I think if you saw about a week ago, our news item from Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji and also Dr. Harshwardhan ji. Now, there is a special boost given to not only Ayurveda, but the entire Ayush, the Ayurveda, Yunani, Yoga, Siddha, whatever we have, Ayush ministry we have currently in the country. And it was a global summit. But the challenge is when you want to like traditional knowledge, whatever we have in Ayurveda and other things, we need to have a scientific validation using whatever modern tools we have currently. I think now efforts are being under this way. So if you can do a proper clinical trial, today CSR is doing a clinical trial for some of the phytopharmaceuticals. So if you do a proper clinical trial, enroll patients, proper placebo data, and then show using marker compounds that how the disease is curing, I think then the trust will be built and it will take over the world. I think absolutely there's nothing against it or for it. So the reason we need to make evidence-based healthcare, basically, um, even if you look at I mean, while India practices homeopathy, for example, Ayush also has a hitch in that. So it has its own criticism. So at the end of the day, any system of medicine has to, based on the modern uh, tools available currently, I think have to give proper validation and proper data. And then it will become uh, uh, useful and people start practicing it. I don't think there's nothing against it per se. So the IIT of Mumbai was working on various basmas some years ago is that's what I was following. But somehow it seems that uh, most of the modern medicines would like to bring in elements of Ayurvedic components and then add more value in a synergistic manner. Somehow that beats the whole purpose of us having a, a, a plethora of information and somehow not being able to prove it. I think, I mean, I think today, honestly, world wants best healthcare and at the affordable cost. So whether it comes from Ayurveda or it comes from modern science or it, modern, what you call allopathic medicine. I mean, India only allopathic word is used most. I don't think it's really used anywhere. Uh, so uh, whether, whatever science, end of the day, what patient wants is a solace. Okay. And a proven solace. I mean, it cannot be a placebo. Okay. You, I hypnotize you and then uh, you will feel better for some time. I think that will not work. So certainly as we get more and more data, and more and more uh, clinical data is available for all these things. Certainly, we will accept everything. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. So, probably this is the last question we are taking. So, I'd like to, uh, Dr. Murli, I'd like to request you to unmute uh, Mr. Deepak Juneja from Chandigarh University. Uh, sir, uh, good evening. I want to ask you a question. That uh, I was just seeing the curve between uh, life expectancy and uh, years, and I was seeing, I noticed that a uh, strange phenomenon after 1970, the life expectancy at birth has started increasing uh, very rapidly. Uh, suppose this curve becomes steeper than one and the life expectancy increases at a rate uh, faster than uh, the years uh, it passes. Uh, all uh, thanks to the advancement in modern medicine. Uh, what I am I am trying to ask you is, uh, can it touch? Uh, there are some uh, theories which are saying that it may touch uh, 140 years. Uh, in 20 years from now, by 2040, or man may become immortal. Uh, what are your views on that? Do you want to live so long? <laughs> I don't want to live that long. Just, just a question. Just, just a curious. Just a deep, I think just, to, I'm just teasing you. I think, I don't think uh, human become uh, immortal. I mean, for that matter, yeah, no living. That thing. I know. That I know. No, because even coronavirus has to disappear someday. Okay. Yes. We know 1918 pandemic. We did not have a vaccine, but uh, if you look at the old history, I think it survived for about one year. Six One months, and a half, seven yes. months, and then I think slowly that curve came down. And because mutations are part of any cellular mechanism, but then what we would like to know is I think the best life expectancy we believe at least is about 120 years or 100 years. Maybe. Okay, as long as uh, human lives, he should be healthy and uh, happy. Because as I told, if you live for 120 years or 140, as you predicted. At the age of 80, if Alzheimer uh, triggers in, then what is the fun of living then? 
so i don't think i mean again i think it's hypothetical the graph is not really to your scale what i showed you it just depict you and then average age when we talk of it is not that everyone is living at 30 years and dying at 30 years no i think many child deaths were there when uh, i was young or my father was very young my grandmother uh, has given birth to 14 children and only three survived so if you take uh, those three survivors of 40 years or 50 years they survived or 60 years but then uh, seven children died at the age of one or two or maybe six months old babies died that's where when we had no vaccines and a lot of infectious diseases like no antibiotics i think that is where that number shot up around 1960s and 70s because those vaccines and drugs were available and world war stopped by the time actually world war also many people died at the age of 23 24 in the war that is how the world average expectancy was low in those years but i think 100 is i think biologically proven time according to me whether you call it uh, mythological or whatever i think end of the day 100 is the norm and if we can all live up to 95 without any ailments i think uh, that should be great yeah okay okay sir and uh, thank you very much sir for your talk and it's been really privilege to hear you so now i would pass to, uh, to dr vinod yeah thank you go ahead thank you sabia so now uh, i invite uh, our uh, respected pro vice chancellor sir professor d narayan rao to present a virtual memento to our distinguished speaker so i raise my hands and receive <laughs> <laughs> we developed the technology for that <laughs> in fact the chenseka uh, you have seen the iit bombay convocation where uh, it was done virtually our colleagues uh, a team uh, led by dr morali they are working maybe soon we will uh, take your avatar and then hand over the memento to you okay. no, 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 rao ji i can tell you give me three more months or four more months uh-huh. uh, give scientists when me is not me Uh-huh. I think by April we will have so many vaccines in the world. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you can come physically to ICT. We can have dinner together. Okay. Take it, take it. But <laughs> now this tube is becoming a new normal. <laughs> you may think, why should I go to Vijay Wada to give one hour talk? Okay, uh, that uh, is the technological uh, evolution. Uh, uh, I have great pleasure in presenting. the memento to the most respected and learned scientist dr chandrasekhar our good friend and well wisher of srm university thank you sir for kindly accepting our lecture also i would like to mention one or two things he gave futuristic ideas he asked a pertinent question what will be the next generation of lights yes let us start thinking the young students who are present for this uh, lecture we think over it involves uh, physics chemistry engineering subjects are you in a position to think what could be the next generation of lights until blue led came into we were not using white leds now you think of another problem he posed to us is how about alzheimers see today we have large number of young people in the country but imagine after 100 years you will have large number of old people also then there is a chance that 80 year old people may prone for alzheimers so it's a good opportunity for this country's young generation to put in efforts in that line and develop uh, drugs or vaccines for alzheimers such Uh, futuristic ideas several i just mentioned only a couple of them dr chandrasekhar has mentioned i'm sure uh, the young generation got an opportunity if you love science you do science that's what he said thank you dr chandrasekhar very much and we wish to have your continued support for us and also maybe this lecture i am so excited once in a year we must organize mm-hmm. because the new batches come in correct hmm also as you know we should go on giving repeated doses a booster yes, dose vaccine <laughs> <laughs> repeated doses of such excitement 
ओके थैंक यू डॉक्टर चंद्रशेखर थैंक यू सो मच ग्रेट थैंक यू थैंक यू सो नाउ आई रिक्वेस्ट आवर पार्थसारदी आवर माय कलीग टू गिव द कंक्लूडिंग रिमार्क्स पार्थ थैंक यू डॉक्टर विनोद एम आई ऑडिबल यस या एज ऑल गुड थिंग्स कम टू एन एंड सो द वेबिनार द ऑनरेबल डिग्नेटरीज डिस्टिंग्विश्ड गेस्ट respected president vice chancellor vice chancellor this is star and the dear participants a good afternoon on behalf of srm university andhra pradesh and its entire fraternity and the organizing committee i feel immense pleasure to take this opportunity to propose a vote of thanks to our eminent speaker dr s chandrashekar director scsar iict hyderabad who spared the time in his busy schedule to grace this university distinguished lecture series with his extremely relevant address on saga of science from 30th century to the 21st century indeed it is a critical topic especially in today's challenging time of pandemic as the pandemic changed everyone's lifestyle setting a new normal in that context it is a very appropriate time to review the evolution of science over the centuries what we have achieved so far and what where to go in the future as our vice chancellor and pro vice chancellor rightly said dr chandrashekar sir is an innovative scientist newsmaker around the globe hope and the promise of our country and a well wisher to srm university a great uh, speaker Martha, Martha, i would like to interrupt here yes, sir. those who are uh, the participants wherever you are sitting we give a big applause Uh, we repeatedly said that Janshagar is the future of hope and promise of the country. Please give a big applause wherever you are. Yeah. Now go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So a, yeah, a great speaker promises the audience that his or uh, her presentation will be in teaching, innovative, educational, and if the audience are lucky, maybe inspiring. In this regard. Dr. Chandrasekhar sir's presentation is the intermix of all these ingredients. Sir, as you rightly said, science is a personal thing that should germinate within the minds. And I hope today's lecture motivated many young minds. Sir, your talk is important, inspiring, and one of the most extraordinary speeches in this lecture series. I take this opportunity to express my deep regards and gratitude to our president, Vice Chancellor. and pro vice chancellor of srm university andhra pradesh for always encouraging us and providing opportunities to organize such events i would especially thank our beloved pro vice chancellor for his unfaltered unfaltered support and confidence in us my deep sense of appreciation and thanks to all the participants who chose to live with us attended the webinar with great enthusiasm and made it successful my sincere gratitude goes to the organizing committee and made it successful uh, for taking topics that matter in today's age and the time finally i thank university itkm for all the technical support throughout the lecture series once again thank you to all for being with us in this afternoon have a wonderful day ahead thank you thank you sir thank you very much sir so now we are leaving the session okay thank you thank you thank sir you. namaskar thank you sir yeah. thank you